me. Hello, this is Zach Whalen and this is the beginning of class. I'm going to shut off the music and hopefully that's just me talking now that you can hear and hopefully you are here for class. So this is Applied Digital Studies, DGSD 395 and I am your professor, Professor Zach Whalen at the University of Mary Washington. Today I'm going to be talking about and introducing Node 3 to you. So I'm um, glad you're online. It's good to see you if you are out there. If people are um, watching it right now, uh, always good to hear whoever's out there. So say hi if you are there, if you don't mind. I'd like to see. I mean, I see that I have nine viewers. So that's good. Lots of people online. So that's good. You know, happy to talk to whomever. But uh, always good to see people like LG Perez saying hi. So good to see you online, LG Perez and Hum and Jesse Bear. Um, great. So. Um, here's the plan for today. I have a new node to introduce to you. This is node three, and this is on, um, hi, Kennedy, Jay Probst, Megan M. I'd like to give the shout outs on the stream. Amber, I see you typing. Um, so, uh, yeah, so today is uh, introducing node three, uh, wrapping up a few things from node two, I think, because some of you might still have questions about that, and also talking a little generally about where we are in the class, where we're headed, and just some of the logistics of what we need to do as a class. So let's talk about some of that first, uh, some of the logistics. So as you can see, as what you're seeing on the screen, this is Node 3, and what you see here is all published, so you're welcome to look through it now. But it's mostly structure, not a lot of content yet, and I, I can talk about the structure uh, shortly, but you know, just bear in mind if you look through it that it's, it's kind of um, skeletal still. Uh, but before I get into that, just wanted to, I guess, remind you or direct you about the face-to-face uh, -face cohorts. Um, so make sure, if you don't, if you could do me a favor, make sure that you are uh, in Canvas the right way and in Discord the right way. Um, so make sure that if you are in a face-to-face -face cohort that I have you in the right one. Um, and if you, uh, I know some of you have requested moving or switching to fully online. And I feel like I'm, I'm not caught up on those. I feel like there are some that I have not quite actually responded to or, or put in the right place yet. So um, let me know if you're in that situation. I just, I got a lot of different requests and I was trying to manage it all. And I, I feel like I didn't get them all. So uh, let me know if that's the case. Uh, if you would like to, to move, uh, that's fine. Uh, I just need to kind of know who to expect uh, because uh, there are a couple of people who I expected this past week that didn't uh, come in person and that might have been just a one-off, you know, you needed to be out for a day or it might be that you actually requested to move fully online and I didn't, and I didn't update your uh, alignment correctly, your cohort alignment correctly. So if that's the case for you, please let me know so I can correct it. Um, a couple of places you can do that. So you've got Canvas and you can look at the people page in Canvas and under F2F cohorts. Uh, or F2, yeah, F2F cohorts, I think is what it's called. Um, you, should, you should see it there. Uh, that's the one that really matters, the one that I, I will check. The other one that you'll see is in Discord. So you have a role assigned to you in Discord that should also correspond to that, should, should be that same cohort. So if you're in a Wednesday or Friday cohort, uh, it should say that. Um, I mentioned all this because the cohorts are kind of shrinking or they were much smaller in week the second week of this delivery modality than they were in the first week. So. Um, I think it is worthwhile to evaluate, does it make sense to keep doing this or does it make sense to rearrange things a little bit more? Uh, because like both for sections one and section two, the total number of people that showed up on Wednesday and Friday together would be enough to fit into the classroom at, at once. That would still be within the, the limits of the classroom. So maybe it would make sense to get those slightly larger groups all together on either Wednesday or Friday as opposed to spreading you out over Wednesday and Friday, and then having a majority of the rest of the class on their own online. So uh, I think just in terms of, you know, being efficient, that might be, that might be a little bit, um, that might work a little bit better, uh, but I want to see where we are with that. I will probably send out a survey or some other kind of poll just to see what your thoughts are about where we are right now and how, how you think we might need to proceed uh, logistically. It is interesting. I'm not sure why, but um, I, you know, I teach two classes, and this uh, this applied digital studies, and I'm also teaching the graphic novel class this semester. So, it, it is interesting. I mean, you all, uh, in, in terms of how you've expressed your preferences for online or face-to-face, -face, um, I kind of would expect that just generally everyone would have kind of the same rate of um, desiring fully online or desiring face-to-face. -face, but it's very different between my applied digital studies class and my graphic novel class. So. I'm not sure why. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, it's all fine. It's just uh, kind of uh, interesting. Um, oh, I see JProps12, you're in both places. So I see how you said that you like that idea. I think maybe you meant um, the combined, the larger group idea. Um, 
but it, yeah, that depends on the numbers, but that's that might be good, and then that might be, I mean, I'm just spitballing here, but it might it might be like a, a live stream on Monday, some kind of coordinated online activity for everyone on Wednesday, and then a face-to-face -face on Friday for those who want that, or, you know, switch those around. But anyway, um, uh, for now, just make sure that you're in the right cohort, that if you want to do face-to-face -face, that you are in the right cohort, you are uh, listed in the right cohort for that. Um, all right, so um, yeah, let me let me briefly go over node two, just in case some of you are still wondering what you need to do for that, because I, I did get some questions, and uh, I you know I think I answered them all, uh, but if not, there, there might be people who have the question who haven't asked it yet. So let me make sure that I get you covered, because some of you still haven't turned it in yet. You know, it's fine to submit it late; it's not a big deal, but um, you should do it soon so we can move on to node three. Uh, all right, so you can see my screen here. This is Node 2 Artificial Intelligence. And uh, Node 2, as you, as you hopefully recall, is very different from Node 1. For Node 1, I put everything into a CoLab notebook and there was content. So it was me saying, here's something you need to know. Uh, and then there was interaction, like asking you to put something in there. And then there was code. So there was kind of three different things blended in there, maybe four if you count external links to, you know, as a, as a kind of thing. Um, and that was a lot in a single CoLab notebook. I, it got kind of overwhelming, I think. And so I wanted to move to a module that lets me organize the content in a different way. So that's what I did for Node 2. It's a similar idea where there's me telling you stuff or giving you links to things, uh, me asking for things in terms of discussion posts or Discord participation, uh, and then some uh, one example of uh, asking you to code something. Um, all of that together is Node 2. So all the things that I'm, I'm scrolling through here, this is Node 2. And the table of contents here kind of looks like the table of contents in that original CoLab notebook, if you recall, uh, for Node 1. And similarly, I've tried to go through and put the smiling, I mean, the waving hand emoji next to places where you should be doing something or could be doing something. Some of these are, are optional, but um, these are places for you to, to make sure you've checked in at different things. There could be a couple others, maybe, but like the debate, I guess I should probably put a hand waving emoji there. Um, but you get the idea, hopefully, that these are places for you to, to do something, to take some action. And then the final thing that you should turn in for node two is down here, where uh, I've asked for essentially a reflection and uh, a summary of what you did. This does not have to be an essay. Um, it could be a video, it could be audio, it could be a list. Um, it just, you know, some, some way for you to say, here's what I did and go back and through all those things and link to them if possible or just describe them if, if you can't or, or don't feel like linking to them. Um, but somehow just kind of account for what you did over these two weeks. Uh, now, one of the things within here, I see a question. Okay, so Kennedy, uh, hopefully these will answer your questions, but if not, um, you know, of course, uh, please ask. Uh, so, so, it, so that's that's there, there are things to do within these pages and discussions, and then what you're turning in is a summary of what you did. Um, sorry, uh, so I think it was a goldfinch just flew by. Um, so the one thing that was the code part is this here generating text with AI, and this is a it's a Canvas page with a link to a collab notebook, and so I can take a look at it briefly here. I already have it up in a few places. Um, this is the only kind of code part of this module uh, or node, and uh, it's a little different because I'm not actually asking you to write code, but I am asking you to work with this code. And that does take a little bit of troubleshooting on your part in some cases, um, and I think that's good. I think trouble, like learning and getting practice with troubleshooting is, is an important skill, maybe the most important skill uh, to develop in this class. So, um, so LC Perez, sorry, yeah, I, I haven't watched it yet, but I, that's okay. <laughs> uh, I don't know if... In Canvas, whenever you look at a video in Canvas, you can set the playback speed to like double, and I, I you know, I do that sometimes. And you're welcome to do that for my videos, because uh, I know I can ramble too. But anyway, so this is uh, sorry, I'm not going to actually run this notebook. Uh, but this notebook, like I said, troubleshooting is probably what you're going to do, uh, and that's okay, right? Um, ideally, it shouldn't take much troubleshooting. Really, the only thing that you might have to figure out on your own is uploading a file and connecting the Google Drive. Um, the instructions are here, but they're pretty minimal. So I, 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 mean, I kind of did it on purpose so that you would have to sort of figure out how to do these things and figuring out how to do something with a, a standard tool like this. I think that's a pretty good skill to develop. So um, you just have to have a plain text file. You have to upload it here into this notebook, run a Markov chain algorithm on it, and you're really just running these cells. Uh, for GPT-2, um, this is the second text generating um, opportunity in here. It's 
it's more steps. These are more uh, confusing steps in the sense that they seem kind of arbitrary. They seem like, why am I doing this? Um, I actually took a lot of this code from Max Wolf. And so some of the stuff like this step six, I feel like is probably redundant, but I couldn't get it to work without doing it. And so I'm not sure why it's, it's necessary, except that this code copy, I think it must be doing something other than literally just copying. Whatever it does, it gets the text, the, the trained model ready to generate text. So you should do it and then come down here um, and run things in step seven. Uh, I, I know some of you got tripped up on my typo in, in this is correct now, but originally it said reset runtime and some of you um, understandably thought I meant factory reset runtime, but I do not and you should not reset the runtime that way. You should restart the runtime, uh, which clears out the memory and then gets it ready to, it, it takes the, the trained, the data that's already been trained and then runs with that. So, you know, it, it's meant to pretty much just work out of the box, but as many of you discovered, sometimes you still have to uh, tweak that box to make it work. Uh, so this should be something that you, you mention in your summary for Node2. Uh, you can link to it if you'd like, but you don't have to. Uh, there's not really much for me to grade here because this is mostly stuff I wrote. So, um, I mean, you might add your own notes if you, if you wanted to, but there's no real prompt for you to do that. So if you did, that's, fine, but it's sort of beyond what I'm asking for. So um, I, I don't necessarily need this, but it would be great if you generate some text, if you could share that in the Discord, um, gen like in the samples channel in Discord, just so other people can see what you generated, because I think that's uh, it's pretty fun. Some of the results are pretty entertaining. Uh, like the one I got, I shared it earlier, but it was where it was using my Star Trek scripts. Um, and it seemed that in my scenario that I, I quoted from, the generated, generated scenario, uh, the Dr. Crusher uh, apparently discovered uh, Picard and Data um, having um, having an affair. They discovered that they were having an affair with each other and they were conflicted about the future of the relationship. And so, and Dr. Pro, Dr. Crusher was trying to give them advice. A, a very strange scene. I don't know where it came from. Not Star Trek, but it was pretty entertaining. So uh, check that out, um, I guess, if you want. But share anything like that you created, because I think that's fun. OK, so uh, can I see? Hopefully that answered your question. Um, and if, if you did, if what you submitted isn't quite right, like there's not a whole lot at stake here. Like It's not like I'm going to um, grade it harshly if you didn't submit the right link somewhere. Like I'll just ask if something's missing. Uh, OK, so let's uh, talk about node 3 then, if that's all right. So these are, um, you can get to this page, by the way, if you click on modules and then you have a view that looks kind of similar to this where you can expand and, and uh, collapse them. I do wish there was like a standalone, just the table of contents for a module. Um, I, don't, I haven't figured out if Canvas generates that or if that's, if I would have to just make that manually, but in any case, uh, here it is. And I'm trying something a little different with the structure. In fact, I think these headings might be redundant. So I might, I might remove those and just kind of make them part of the pages. What I'm going to try to do is instead of having like a page and then sub pages uh, for, as like a table of contents, I'm going to try to put everything that is associated with a particular day of class on a single canvas page. And that might end up being some long pages at some point, but I don't know. I think that might make it easier to find certain things. So like if you miss a day, you can just go to that day's page and then everything would be there. Uh, I think that might be easier for you. So um, that's what I'm going to try. Uh, it'll still be a module like Node 2, so you'll just kind of click through it uh, thing by thing if you are, or, day, or page by page if you are doing this asynchronously. Um, but yeah, that's that's the idea. And for each of these, I've got a header like this top here, this metadata for this that tells you everything about that particular day of class. So for today, this is September 28th. Um, it's a live stream on Twitch. Um, it reminds you about Node 2 and links to Node 2. And this is what I'm doing right now. And then this is what you should be doing after class. And I'll talk about these two. Um, I can also, maybe I could actually link the archived live stream here. Yeah, I mean, I certainly can. Maybe I should. Um, the other thing that you, you'll notice is that I've added these to the to do. Um, so what this means is that it'll show up on, like this page will show up as coming up when you look at it in your calendar, if you look at your, your Canvas calendar or on like on the, on the right sidebar. Um, so that's just another way to kind of prompt you towards what I want you to see for each day of class. Um, it's sort of redundant, but I feel like providing multiple avenues to the same information is 
helpful. So uh, that's that's what I'm doing there, and that's what you'll see. It does not mean that there's a do thing, like something to turn in for each of these days. It just shows up as like here's this is associated with this day of class. So hopefully that that makes sense, and hopefully it's not too too redundant, I guess. Um, okay, so so let me zoom back out to this module page. Yeah, see, I wish there was like a view of this module link or something. Maybe I guess I could just add that manually. Um, but let's take a look at what we're actually talking about for this module. And you can get a sense of this just by skimming the headlines or the titles for each of these days. Um, and um, here's what I'm interested in for this. As you can see, uh, the theme or the title of this note is Connections. And I mean a couple of different things by connections, but I think those things are linked to each other. Uh, they are connected. <laughs> uh, here's, here's what I'm interested in for today, at least, in the next couple of days. Um, when we think of the web, the World Wide Web, the internet, uh, we're talking about connecting, right? I mean, we connect to the internet, we connect to each other via the internet. Um, how we do that and why we do that has really changed since I've been online. And part of what I want to talk about and uh, invite you to think about is that history and that evolution of how things have changed uh, for, for a couple of reasons. I, I think it's important to understand kind of the present moment and the ways in which being connected via Facebook actually means uh, being, uh, just as an example, Facebook is just one example, but um, connecting to people, being a friend of someone there, following someone there, certainly does not mean being actual friends or sharing ideas um, or ideologies with each other. Um, I think if, if any of you or I, if, if, certainly if I were to just off the top of my head characterize the current landscape of social media, I think I would use words like siloed, uh, polarized, um, alienated. Um, there are ways in which we are really not connecting in any kind of meaningful social or cultural sense through Facebook. We just, I mean, at least, I, I don't know about you, but I'm friends with people that I can't not be friends with, if that makes sense, and you probably have people in your life like that, uh, whose ideas I really, I don't need to see every day, and whose ideas um, stress me out, and so I, I don't seek out that kind of connection through Facebook. Um, and this is just one small example of how social media, despite its having the word social in it, is actually very antisocial. Um, we don't think of the internet as a vast landscape that we can explore. We think of it through our silos, through the platforms that we prefer um, or that we're required to use, um, you know, Facebook, Canvas, Reddit, whatever it is. And if we think of that as the internet, it's, it's, it's really sad actually. Um, it, so much has been lost and left behind from earlier eras of connecting online. And I, part of what I want to do is kind of get back to that or at least understand what was lost. Um, that's important to help understand how it got to where we are right now, but also I think we might be at an inflection point. Um, many people share the same kind of feelings I'm expressing about social media. Possibly you do as well. Um, this idea that it's sort of run its course or that it's, it's we, we need to think about uh, alternatives and uh, understand what else we could do. And so maybe by looking at the past, we'll learn about and think towards what we could do uh, instead of having a Facebook profile. Uh, so I, I don't know. I mean, I'm being a bit utopian in my thinking about this, certainly, um, but I don't know what else to be <laughs> like. That's, I, I mean, I, I think you have to be, you have to look for optimism sometimes. So that that's kind of, that's the background for this um, this node. And uh, one of the things I want to start talking about and connecting to is uh, a, a particular time period of being online that I've, I don't know if other people are using this term, but I think of it as the, the, the World Wide Web's golden age. So this is a moment in starting from say 95, 96 up to maybe 2002. Uh, this is a time period when lots and lots of people were getting online for the first time, creating content on the, on the web and connecting to each other on the web. And this was the this time period does sort of coincide with the dot com bubble and bust, uh, the, the economic um, you know consequences of that. But there is this kind of groundswell or, or grassroots kind of just movement of people doing just random things on the internet because they have no idea not to. And I think that's that's what I'm I'm really excited about trying to get back to, uh, or think back to. I don't know I don't know how to do it, but. Um, and that's something that I, I would like to uh, invite you to learn a bit more about. So um, that's what we're, I'm going to talk a little bit about today and then 
Um, I've got some, some suggestions for you to do to explore further and uh, we'll talk about those things and move ahead with them uh, starting on Wednesday. Now, one thing you'll see, let me kind of kind of surf through these pages here a little bit. Um, for each of these days, there's gonna be like a goals for today, which is what's gonna happen that day. And then there will be differentiated instructions for whichever modality. So the goals are the same for everyone, but if you're online synchronously uh, and, or online asynchronously, you might have a different path to that, uh, to achieving that goal. So that's gonna all be in the single page. It'll just be, um, It'll just be there. Uh, the uh, And then there will be a before class, like the things you need to make sure you've done before class and then what you need to work on next. So I, you know, when, once these are filled in, like the before class that I'll put for, for Wednesday will be um, the same as the after class from today, if that makes sense. So you can hopefully see those things connecting. Um, so, uh, but looking at the content, right? The goals for today, these are pretty much filled in. So um, I wanna talk about the origins and the history of hypertext. Um, that is both a concept and a technology, and I want to talk about both, and I want to show you how to use the technology, like how to create hyperlinks. Um, and that will involve some HTML basics. Now, right here, this is a good segue into a slight tangent topic, but in the overall picture of this class and its purposes, um, I actually know a lot about most of you um, in terms of your experience, because um, a number of you, I haven't done the math on it, but um, I would say 90% of you in this class were either in my spring DGST 101 class or my summer DGST 101 class. So I know several things if you are in that group. So uh, I know that you have a domain, so you have the ability to create content on the web. Um, if Even if you weren't in my class, you probably have a domain. So, um, you know, if not, I can help you get one, but that's the idea. Uh, that's, what I, that's one of the things that I take for granted. Um, the other thing that I know is that if you were in my spring 101, I don't know if you remember that long ago, but uh, I, I modified one of the assignments pretty radically to remove the requirement of making a web page. Um, I, usually when I teach that assignment, I involve some instruction in HTML and CSS to hand code a web page. I took that out of the spring class. I put it back in for the summer class. So the summer class, you if you came to my summer class, you probably did that. If you came to my spring class, you probably didn't. Um, I think it's an important skill set, and it's a concept that uh, actually is what people were doing in the late 90s, but it also still works. Like it's still the fundamental technology of the web and most apps that we use. So I think there is still a lot of value in, in understanding and being able to do HTML. So even though the thing we're going to do with it is kind of quirky, um, the skill that you develop from it is actually useful. So. You know, trust me on that, it's, it's fine, it's good. So that's why you see on Wednesday, I'll talk a little bit about HTML basics, or if you're working online, I'll give you something that you can use to start learning about HTML basics. Um, some of you that might be review, you might already feel like you know HTML pretty well, but that's okay. When it comes time to generate the project, to build a project uh, with HTML, um, you can just build on what you already have done before. Um, and uh, if you're doing it for the first time, you know, start from, start from scratch, and that's great. You know, make that your first project. Uh, so let's see. Um, yeah, so as you see by Friday, I'll talk about HTML and text editors, um, uh, how to build a sub, how to make a subdomain on on your main domain. So these are things you know uh, that I will explain, or I will give you links to things to help you figure it out yourself. And I think ultimately that's going to be a theme with HTML and CSS in particular. I think that um, there are many ways you can learn it. There are are thousands of different YouTube tutorials you can find that, that you can learn it yourself via the, one of those. You might find the particular teaching style of a YouTube a YouTuber uh, better than what I can do, or you might prefer hearing it from me. Uh, either way is fine if you learn it. Um, or there's lots of just interactive web tutorials. There's lots and lots of ways to learn HTML and CSS. Um, so I find that most students benefit from having access to multiple ones of those. And uh, we can talk about the pros and cons, but basically, I, I'm counting on a lot of this learning for HTML and CSS to be things that you um, you commit to in terms of what you need to do. So if you know you want to do a certain thing in terms of your website, learn the things that you need in order to do that. And I can point you in the right direction, hopefully, but um, hopefully you all will be doing lots of different things. Uh, okay, so then skipping, moving all the way in here uh, to the end. Yeah, the end of this node will be pretty similar to the end of node two, where I'm going to ask you to review and reflect on the things that you did for node three. Um, and that will include a web page. So uh, there will be a specific thing that you do and produce and share on the web. Um, 
and I will of course write instructions for that, but it's going to be a little different and a little bit unusual. This is this whole node is a new thing for me, so I'm uh, um, I'm excited about putting it together. So I guess I'll just say it that way. Uh, I have an interesting idea that I don't know if you're going to like it or not, but I I'm pretty excited about it. Okay, so the um, uh, so that's the basic roadmap of of this node. Uh, it's going to be learning about the history of connecting through the internet. Um, and the, the practical, that's going to be the cultural side, and then the, the practical side will be um, coding HTML and CSS. Coding with HTML, designing with CSS. Uh, and, and we'll talk about what all those things, well, the, what all those acronyms mean um, later, I guess. Uh, so if, if you have, of course, if you have any questions as I'm going, uh, feel free to drop them into chat, by the way. I haven't seen anybody recently, but lots of people still watching, obviously. So you know, hopefully this is all making sense. Um, Usually this would be, I would kind of turn to you all and ask if you have any questions, but if you don't, I'm just gonna proceed with a few explanations. Okay, so like I said, the idea of the web here is uh, the, the, the golden age is what we're what I'm interested in. Um, and I'm gonna add some more notes to this page uh, based on what I'm talking about now, but uh, the idea is what I would like for you to do on your own, you can start this now or um, sometime before Wednesday is one or two of these suggestions here to explore the history of the web and the past of the web. And the Wayback Machine is actually an excellent place to start. So let's take a look at the Wayback Machine. Uh, the Wayback Machine is um, hosted at web.archive.org. The Internet Archive is the organization that provides this service. What it does, this is software that browses every web page that it knows of and makes a copy of it. Um, and this copy is preserved and hosted on archive.org. Uh, so you, if you own a website, you can choose to have your website excluded from it. Um, but otherwise, if it's on the open web, like it's something that doesn't require a password or whatever, uh, then it could be in Wayback Machine. It's pretty fun to go back in time. So let's take a look at, I like to do this here as my example, um, uh, mwc.edu. Um, of course, we could look at umw.edu, but mwc is what we used to be originally. Actually, why don't we start with, no, no, we'll start with mwc, because this is, this is good. Uh, mwc, we can go all the way back to 1996 for this one, so let's get the earliest possible one. Oh, yeah. October 18th, 1996. Let's see what our school's homepage looked like 24 years ago. <laughs> nice. It looks about the same as it did for a while actually. Uh, so when you look at things in the Wayback Machine, this like toolbar at the top lets you uh, jump around to different dates, like different snapshots of this same page. So if this one doesn't load particularly well, then we can look at another one. As you can see, it takes a while to load. Um, Archive.org privileges storage over bandwidth. So like they don't serve the content very quickly, um, but that's okay. I mean, their, their goal is to save stuff and then they have, I'm sure, zeta bytes of data now. Um, but yeah, there it goes. Finally, the banner showed up. Oh, cool. We even got the most of the navigation images. Let's see. Yeah. Oh, comments. Okay. This one doesn't usually show up. Um, I'm excited because I, I've looked at this before, but I, I don't usually get this much of the banner. Um, archive.org doesn't load all the images. As you see on the left here, it just didn't save a copy of many of these section links here, except for this one for student life, uh, which I always like to see if I can... Yeah, if we view this image, you can see kind of, um, kind of what I mean. You probably recognize this spot on campus, walk across from Trinkle. Um, that's you know that's where this is. <laughs> I feel like this is in Trinkle, looking toward Lee Hall off to the right. I feel like this is the bench that got destro destroyed by a tree falling on it uh, a couple years ago. I think uh, I'm not sure. Uh, this could be. I'm not sure how far down this is. This also could be a little bit farther down. Um, next to like those flower beds that have like the big elephant ear things in them sometimes. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but that's, it's definitely recognizable as Campus Walk, right? And I, it's, it's fascinating. So like this dude right here, he's this guy's probably 50 years old by now. Um, <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, okay, so that's MWC. I wanted to see about this comments section to see what this is. This may not work. I mean, the archive is not complete. It's not exhaustive by any means, but you can find surprising things in it sometimes. Oh, neat. Okay, great. <laughs> I love this. Uh, okay, so this is, 
I mean, part of what I'm trying to, to show you is just a different tone, like a different idea for what the web was for and how people would use it. And so I love a lot of things about this. So this page here, it gives us the URL down here. It gives us, uh, if you have comments or questions, you just click that link and that's Ernest Ackerman's email address. Uh, Ernie Ackerman founded the computer science department at UMW in the early 1980s. And he is, uh, he's retired now obviously, but he, um, yeah, I don't know. He, I bet he still checks this email knowing him. Um, or just, no, it doesn't like work. But anyway, Ernie's great, um, but he, it's funny that like, the chair of the, the computer science department, it was his job to make the website, of course, and he just put his his name on it. And it's like, if you have any more questions, let me know. Um, I would not do that now. Like, I would certainly not put my name, I mean, I might put a form like this, but I wouldn't, I mean, I do have a form like this on my website, but um, I wouldn't just put my email address out there. Uh, yeah, this is fun. People, let's see what this is. Oh, calendar, oh, wow. This is like updates to the website. This is great. Um, here's a uh, faculty staff directory, a student directory, personal home pages. <laughs> Sorry, I, see this is the this is like the rabbit hole of this kind of thing. It's like I want to see the personal home pages. I want to see what people were doing with their home pages back in 1996 on a university web server. Oh, great. Oh wow. Okay, I've got to find people I actually know. So these are oh, they, well, these are students. Oh, neat. This is fascinating. Okay, I, I don't know any of these students. I know many of these faculty members. Let's see what Bob Rycroft, <laughs> Rycroft was doing in 1996 with his homepage. There you go. Um, pretty, <laughs> pretty straightforward, right? Uh, oh man, this is fascinating. I'm sorry, I'm getting really excited about exploring these sites. Let's just pick on, I don't know, Nora McIntyre. Let's see what her website is. Oh, it's not captured. Oh, well. Slack, I don't know what that is. Oh, okay. Let's try another one. Just this one more, Eric Levy. Nate Hertz, that name sounds familiar. Yeah. Oh, okay, it's working. Eric's homepage, I, welcome. Obviously you've stumbled onto my little corner of the web to find out more about me, go here. If you're interested in Mary Washington College, click on the building on the right to go to the homepage. My cat page. Um, the paintball page, uh, links to his friend's home pages, an under construction GIF. Uh, this is very much an artifact of its time and I, I am excited about this under construction GIF especially. Um, these little animated GIFs really are the signature aesthetic move of this era of web design and I think it's great. Um, so the cat page, I don't know. I mean, this I could, I could probably spend a lot of time exploring these websites, but I, I, that was not the point of this. I, I mainly just wanted to show you how the, how the uh, Wayback Machine works. Um, we can explore any other website. In fact, let's try let's try one more, uh, one more tangential one. I know I need to move on, but I, I really wanted to see kind of a different era of web design. If we look at umw.edu, um, and course this would have taken over I mean would not have existed before 2005 so or four 2004 or five probably they had the domain ready before the school officially changed names um, uh, the site is currently I mean theoretically being redesigned by the way as part of the uh, the whole Re advertising, mind power, branding stuff. They're gonna redo the website. So I've heard, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what's happening, but I think that's, I think that is still happening. Well, it's taking a bit and it's not that important. So I'm not gonna sit here and wait for it. Um, but uh, I wanted to mention one site. So geocities.com was really the, the main site that people used to explore their creativity and experiment with experiment with what it meant to be online and to create content online. And for many people, those were the same things. So to be online wasn't just Googling things because Google didn't exist. It was putting up your web page with things you're interested in and letting, hoping people would find you. And if they found you, then you would, you would connect your sites together with a link uh, or you would join what's called a web ring, which would automatically link together sites that were connected and related in some ways. So let's take a look at GeoCities uh, with the Wayback Machine. 
And um, GeoCities uh, is shut down uh, now, uh, obviously, I guess, or unsur unsurprisingly. It was purchased by Yahoo in 1999 and kept going for a little while. It then, um, like many things that Yahoo purchased, uh, it died. And Yahoo, um, they did the same with LiveJournal, I think, right? Um, and they, is it LiveJournal? Well, and they're in the process of doing that with Tumblr, I guess, right now. Um, but the, uh, you know, I guess among all these platforms, I think Tumblr probably gets the closest to the um, ethos of the original web. But let's go back to GeoCities. Let's look at 1997 for GeoCities, and let's just pick a random date. April 17th, 1997. So GeoCities was, uh, you, when you signed up for an account, you got a homepage, and you got... Um, and you got uh, email. Um, web pages would be, they would you really use the term home and really kind of lean into the idea of being in a home because homes would be in neighborhoods or regions and those neighborhoods or regions would be thematic. So like things that are sports related would be in the Coliseum. Things that were science fiction related would be in Area 51 and others had geographic names uh, like you know cities or, or countries. Um, so, you know, lots of things, and uh, let's see, this one, it says, this is today's cool homestead. So let's take a look at Coliseum Fields 1263, 1263. Um, so when GeoCities shut down, it, um, or as it was about to shut down, several different groups stepped in and tried to save it uh, by making copies of it, uh, basically. And so uh, the Wayback Machine is one of those. Uh, there's also this site, Oo Cities, or O Cities, or I don't know how, you, uh, they, how, how they want you to pronounce it, but it's oocities.org, and it has um, the, a schema of, um, it, it basically has a browsable schema of, of, a browsable copy of GeoCities that uses the same kind of schema that GeoCities originally used. So if you want, if you know what you're looking for, you can find it. Um, but if you don't, then you're pretty much just clicking around randomly. So this, this idea, clicking around randomly, this is one of the things that I'm suggesting you do uh, after class today to explore kind of the old, like the old wild west of the web. Um, I don't, you, who knows what you're going to find, right? I mean, that's part of the fun of this. Um, some of it might be quirky. Uh, some of it might be really offensive. I have no, I literally no idea. And that's part of the fun, part of the danger of this. Um, it's a kind of browsing that we don't do anymore because we almost always are either staying within the safe spaces of uh, Facebook, Twitter, or, or our, our bubble, right? I mean, our ideological bubbles our silos on these things. And uh, the, the exciting thing about GeoCities was you could just find whatever. And also it wasn't just GeoCities, just GeoCities was one major platform, but every like university had its own web hosting like you saw from the MWC page there. And so just college students putting their random websites out there, that was a big part of the web during that golden era. Uh, so it's it's part of this too. So this is an example, let's see, this was the GeoCities, this is the their featured page, looks like someone's a big Braves fan. Um, you can certainly see some, okay, nice. So you can see several um, features of 90s web design here. So one is the bright colors. Um, there probably was supposed to be a background image. That was almost always, you almost always have background images. You have a fan poll where you can leave comments. Um, usually most people had a guest book where you could like type your name and say, hey, I went to your website. Um, you know, it's not something we do today. Uh, we've got uh, ad banners. Uh, we've got a, a hit counter here, which doesn't work on this hosted version, understandably, but um, the page has been accessed like the number of times that it's been accessed. That's, that's usually what that would show up as. Uh, now this down here, this is the web ring. And so this is where this particular person has, uh, I guess Adam, has made this website and then uh, applied for membership in this Atlanta Braves web ring. And this might, this link might work. Um, but a web ring would be a third site, a site, another website that has a master list of all of the, the websites and all the links in the Atlanta Braves web ring. And so uh, you would insert a little code on your web page that would let other people find that web ring from your page. And then as you can see here, just kind of jump around in that web ring to find other Braves content. In this case, Atlanta Braves content or whatever it is. Um, let's see. I don't even, I mean, this, it won't work now because this is a, it's a, di a dynamic script. Uh, it's linking to a dynamic script on a website that doesn't exist anymore, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, webring.org, I'm pretty sure, is not up and running anymore. But we'll just 
try it and see, but I don't have any hope that it will. Um, the point being, this is a way of connecting. And if you want to get, if, if we get back to the whole premise of this node, um, I'm interested in how people connect online and how people used to connect online. Uh, it used to be the case that, yeah, it's not in here. Um, it used to be the case that people would connect via things they were interested in or things that they thought um, people that liked them would like. And the idea that you could put it together and put it on your own website and share it with the world just because you want other people to see it uh, is something that we just, we don't do that much anymore. At least I don't, I mean, maybe, maybe I'm cynical, but I feel like I, I put out so little content. Uh, what I do is very carefully uh, curated in terms of who I think is gonna respond to it on whichever platform I put it in. And uh, there was much more, I guess, freedom and much more experimentation in this, this 90s era. And I feel like we, we've lost that. Um, we, uh, we think of things in terms of the platform and not in terms of just whatever. And I think that just whateverness is something that we, I regret that we've lost. So this is an, the UU Cities thing. And, and the way UU Cities works, you really just have to click on a random number and see what you can find. Um, it loads very slowly. I don't know what this particular one is, 1719. Um, this is going to take me to some GeoCities users storage space on that platform. And uh, we'll see what it is. It's Area 51, so it could be science fiction related or conspiracy related. Uh, there was a lot of that on Area 51. A lot of X-Files content. And, you know, it was just different people with their stuff they wanted to say about X-Files. Uh, okay. Wipe your feet and come inside. Okay. Oh, wow. 60 minutes with God version 1.3. What in the world? Uh, I don't know what's going on here, but you can see there's the, the web ring. A lot of websites had this web ring. Microsoft Word format. Okay. And ideas about creation, God, heaven, hell, Adam and Eve, the Bible. Cool. All right. After going to death's domain. What is death's domain? I don't know, but it's linking me. I can see it's linking me to another user's site. So if you can see the URL that this goes, this is uh, Athens Forum 3135. Huh, okay, but I want to enter this one that I'm in right now and see what this is. Something about death domain. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to get here. And again, that's the fun of it, right? In terms of this kind of exploration, you know, again, we don't do this anymore. Um, at least there's very little reason to, except like now I'm, I'm asking you to do it. Um, we tend to think of the web, and I think Google is a lot, a big part of this. When, when Google arrives, we, we kind of know what we're looking for. We type it into Google and we click the first or second link and that's it. Um, this idea of content just being something you explore via web ring by clicking on a link that says take me to some random website within this I think connects us to content and ideas in a much uh, a much more organic way a much more natural way and it is um, it's again something that I, I kind of miss um, so this is interesting I think I'm the man behind the metaphor what 60 minutes I'm I am kind of curious this sounds like um, someone's manifesto or fan fiction of death, I think. Um, and what you can see down here, this is a very common uh, website organization, right? The frame set is what we would call this. So this is a case where um, back in the olden times, whenever you were coding, let's say you had 10 pages on your website, um, you wanted to have consistent navigation across every page on that website. Uh, it, you would have to code each of those navigation lists by hand and then if you changed something within those or you wanted to add a new navigation item and say you added a new page you'd have to go back to every other page and then update them with that link so one workaround people found for that is what's called a frame set so this page at the bottom this bit at the bottom is a window onto a single page that is the navigation of this site um, and so this person has set it up so they just have to change that one frames contents and then every other page within the site I imagine has the same frame set down below. Um, frame sets are not what we do now in web design because we have content management engines that will generate things dynamically. And so we don't need this kind of thing. It's, as you can see, pretty clunky. Uh, so I, there's a good reason we don't have this anymore. 
um, but it does still work. Uh, I don't really recommend creating websites with frame sets anymore. There's really no justification for it. Um, this is just, you know, to show you more examples of web 1.0 design, uh, the, the sort of star field background is very common. Um, this is an application form to join a sci-fi connections web ring. Uh, that's pretty cool. This is someone's website about wrestling and there's a web wrestling web ring down here. Pretty cool, I guess. Uh, this is uh, someone who's into extreme sports like snowboarding and BMX biking. And you can see, again, several features of web 1.0 design. Um, you know, low quality uh, GIF images, um, marquee text that scrolls left and right, this GIF of the uh, disco ball, love it. Um, lists of links, <laughs> very common. Um, just kind of skipping through some examples. I don't know how this one is, but again, you know, web, uh, the, the X-Files content is very, is very strong. So this is one of many ways people connected, and I am almost out of time, so I wanted to show you one Oh, that's not what I was. That's not what I was looking at. Um, I'll show you two other things you can you can do as homework. These are optional, so like all of this that I'm assigning here, I just want you to do one or maybe two of these four things that are listed at the bottom of uh, the page for today. Um, so uh, explore OO cities or OO cities. If you find a website that you think is really cool, share it with us in Discord. Um, or you can explore things with the Wayback Machine. Again, if you find something cool, especially like maybe an old, uh, like a UMW alum from the 90s, their webpage from the 90s, that would be pretty cool. Uh, the Social Dilemma is a movie that just came out on Netflix. It's a documentary slash drama, and it deals with some of the issues, some of the issues about where we are right now. And if we are at a turning point, this is the kind of message we need to hear at this turning point. Um, I have some thoughts about this document, uh, this documentary. Um, I'm not going to share those now because you might want, I, you might watch it, and I, I'd like for you to form your own opinions. Um, it is good. It's entertaining. It's interesting. It talks about a lot of the things we've been talking about, like algorithms and AI, and how they relate to these different platforms or how they're used on these different platforms. I think it does a really good job of that of explaining that. Um, the overall message of it, I think. That's what I have thoughts about, but um, basically, it's it's several different people who used to work at Google, Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, uh, talking about what they did and why they now regret it in terms of building these platforms and making them so addictive. It talks a lot about addiction, so um, I recommend it. I think you should watch it, but I have some uh, questions about it. But anyway, you, yeah, tell me, you know, take a look at that or one, do one of these other things, and um, we'll talk about what you find and what you think uh, on Wednesday. Let me briefly explain Lambda Moo um, because this is very different than these other things uh, and it, it bears demonstration. So um, thinking back to this golden age, making a website wasn't the only way to connect with people online. Uh, it was one of many. So chat rooms were a big thing. So things like AOL uh, and then AOL's Instant Messenger, uh, ICQ, IRC, um, you know, Freenode, lots of different ways people were chatting online and Discord is very much a direct descendant of those. So we still do that. Uh, we just think of it as a different kind of thing. And Discord has other affordances that are added on top of it. But the core behavior in, that you do in Discord or Slack is really just there's a direct line from the old uh, chat relays of, of the past. Um, one of the interesting relatives of those is something called a MUD or a MOO. And those terms are, are slightly you know synonyms. But uh, these are chat servers where you connect and then you essentially role play. Um, you connect as a character or as yourself, but you as a self have properties like a name and a gender and a description. And you can do things like you can um, explore areas, you can pick up items, you can attack other characters with those items sometimes, depending on how it's coded. Um, it's something that is very different than what we're used to doing. I, I used to think of this, uh, I used to, in grad school, I helped, used to help run a server like this, and we called it text based virtual reality. Um, this is uh, this link here is telling you a little bit about one called Lambda Moo. Lambda Moo is probably the most famous Moo server, and this, these instructions are quite old, but they might work. Um, I am working on this. I can write a more updated version of this, I suppose. Um, I ended up. Let me show you how to. Let me show you what it looks like, and then if you would like to pursue this, uh, I know a couple of people in Slack. I mean, Discord just now were successful because I saw them do this. Um, if you go to, let me switch this on here. So this software that I'm pulling up here is called Mudlet. And this is basically a, an elaborate command line kind of environment that has lots of bells and whistles added for the purposes of 
connecting to a MUD server. So let me see, oops. Um, interestingly, it uh, looks like, ah, pink guest, I believe is actually one of the other students in section one. Um, let me let me start this over again, the connection over again so you can see what it looks like from the beginning. I'm hitting the connect button and then I have to type commands down here. So I'm typing connect a guest that's letting me in. Uh, there's a terms of service, yes, to accept. And then it drops me in a place called the coat closet. So it gives me a description of the room I'm in. The closet is a dark cramped space. It appears to be very crowded in here. You keep bumping into what feels like coats, boots, and other people apparently who are apparently sleeping. Um, one useful thing that you've discovered in your bumbling about is a metal doorknob set at waist level, blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to type uh, out to exit the closet and now I'm in the living room. It says here, it is very bright, open and airy here with large plate glass windows looking southward over the pool to the gardens beyond. Um, it reads me longer, the rest of the description goes down here. Then here it says, these are, this is the contents of the room I'm in right now. There's a welcome poster, a fireplace a couch, a statue, a cockatoo, a person finder, a lag meter, uh, the birthday machine, and a map. And then there are these people here. There's someone called Butter, someone called Distant Origin, and someone called Rusty. These might be bots. Um, we can learn a bit more about them just by, I'm typing exam Rusty, and it gives me a description. Uh, Rusty is owned by himself. So Rusty is a character, like a player. Um, we can see his description here. I think I saw that he's gendered masculine. Uh, somebody bonked her toe, I think. Um, she'll be okay. Mom, her mom's here. Um, uh, but you know, so Rusty is a real person as far as I can tell, and I could have a conversation with Rusty um, if I'd like to, but I don't know who Rusty is, so I'm kind of nervous about just starting a conversation with a random stranger. Um, I Let's see, um, I can also look at Rusty to get a simpler ex description of Rusty. Uh, oh yeah, so gender, he is gendered masculine. Um, he's been staring, staring off into space for five minutes. That means he was active five minutes ago. So, all right. Um, you can also look at yourself. So I'm going to type look at me and it says I am, I'm just called guest. So, okay. And uh, I am nondescript. Um, you can apply for an account and create a description for yourself and do other things with this if you, if you want to. Um, if there are multiple guests connected, you get a color with your, um, with your name. So earlier, uh, Someone in section one was the pink guest and I was the infrared guest. Uh, so uh, whatever, right? Um, so Mudlet is a software. There are multiple platforms, like there are Windows Mac versions of it. This is Linux that I'm using this on right now. Uh, and that's probably the easiest way to do it. If you do that, when you connect to it, it's uh, the server address is, um, it's on that page that I linked to in the page descriptions. And I'll, I can add some more to these notes, um, but it's lambda.mu.mud.org lambda and then the port is 8888. And then we can connect this way. Um, there might even be a, a Discord bot that'll let us connect that way, and I'm going to look into I'm going to look into that because that might be fun. I saw some of you having fun with Eliza, for example. Um, although I wonder if Eliza's Eliza was asleep the other day. I wonder if it's back online. Let's see. I'm going to see if Eliza is awake. No, Eliza is not awake. I don't know what happened. That was just some bot I added. So I don't know, uh, whoever hosts that must have turned it off. Um, I don't know, maybe I'll make my own version of Eliza, of an Eliza bot. So anyway, um, sorry this was kind of all over the place today, but I wanted to introduce you to several things, mainly the structure for Node 3. So uh, take a look at that and for homework, you got do at least one of those four things. So it's, you know, check out Lambda, um, check out um, Uo Cities. Uh, look at GeoCities in the archive, or watch that video, watch that document, uh, documentary film, uh, The Social Dilemma. So choose one or two of those activities to get ready for uh, Wednesday. And then I will see several of you in class on Wednesday, um, but uh, double check your cohort, make sure you know when you're supposed to be showing up or not. Uh, make sure that you are in the right cohort because what's where you are in Canvas, that's where I expect you. Um, so even if you've told me that you wanna move, double check canvas to make sure that I have actually moved you because I might not have, I might have forgotten to. Okay, so uh, I think that's all I have to cover for today. Uh, I've gone a little bit long, so I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up here. Um, thanks for watching, and if you find anything interesting in GeoCities or UO Cities or anywhere else like that, uh, definitely share it in Discord. I look forward to seeing what you find. Okay, have a good evening, bye.